Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Farzana Badi, and I have been told that I have to start on time and end on time. Um, so we are going to start. Uh, I am the founder of Digital Medusa, and we are doing this workshop on can a layered policy uh, approach stop internet fragmentation? And so, uh, so and we are going to have a conversation, and uh, we, uh, we are going to have a dialogue with you uh, after our speakers' uh, remarks. Um, but a little bit of what is a layered approach? Well. Um, there are different interpretations of, of that, uh, but a layered, uh, 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 by a layered approach, we mean that uh, we have these seven uh, layers of the, of the internet, which the basic part of it is the network uh, layer where the IP addresses and other critical properties of the internet that allow connectivity to happen. Uh, they're, they are there, and then they're on top of that, you have the apps, and then uh, you have other uh, services. But this was a very simplified version. You can, of course, tackle me later on about like, uh, whether that definition was accurate. But why is it important to talk about a layered approach to policy uh, making, and how can it stop internet fragmentation? Uh, one of the... Um, uh, one of the research, uh, research reports that I have done in the past was about internet and sanctions, and I have used, uh, so the uh, government and policymakers want to sanction uh, human rights violators, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, this is like a legitimate policy tool. However, when they do that, uh, they also can uh, affect access to the internet if the sanction applies to internet infrastructure. So um, I have used this kind of layered approach to, in a report on internet and sanction, to kind of show how um, the internet infrastructure can be actually affected by sanctions and how the governments can, that actually care about, uh, uh, about the open global internet and want to avoid fragmentation can um, uh, prevent that from happening uh, by having more targeted uh, and a layered approach to policy making on uh, sanctions. This is one example of it. I hope I'm trying to make this as tangible as I can. I can see a lot of uh, familiar faces, so you know what the layered approach is, and you know what the OSI model is, uh, but for the policymakers and civil society in general, when they make recommendations, we are trying to make this session as practical as possible uh, to uh, kind of look at uh, the layered approach and see if we can actually stop internet fragmentation, uh, and uh, but also come up with policies, come up with uh, content regula uh, uh, regulation and policies and other uh, uh, needed uh, regulatory frameworks. And of course, recommendations of civil society how, how to adopt those. Um, so with us today, we have, and this is a this workshop is co-organized with Internet Society, and uh, today we have um, Nobuhisa Nishigata. Uh, he's the director of Computer Communications Di uh, Division at the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications, MIC Japan. He has a uh, has been instrumental in convening IGF in uh, uh, Japan and. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, and there is a very long bio that I think Nobu, Nobu, can, Nobu can introduce himself a little bit more if he wants to. And we have also uh, Alisa Starzak, uh, uh, the Vice President and Global Head of Public Policy at Cloudflare with us today. Alisa can uh, make it very tangible what internet infrastructure is involved uh, when, uh, when we use the internet and uh, how we can come up with policies um, that consider that kind of uh, division. And uh, we also have Jean Keralt. I have practiced the, the last name like a few times. I got it right. 
I'm sure. And John is uh, the founder and CEO of the IO Foundation, a nonprofit advocating um, for data centric digital rights. Um, and then we have Konstantinos Kometas as the commentator. Konstantinos um, did not want, resisted coming to the panel and sit here. He wanted to be with the crowd in a bottom up manner. Um, and uh, he is a non resident fellow with the Demo uh, Democracy Tech Initiative of the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab. He is also a veteran of developing and analyzing internet policy to ensure an open and global internet. Before I go uh, to the panels, also I wanted to mention that. Uh, Internet Society also has um, an internet impact assessment tool that can be very useful um, in a kind of like using this kind of layered approach in order to come up with policies that cannot, uh, that do not lead to internet fragmentation. But if you also like want to know why internet fragmentation is bad, my take is that in, like we want the uh, internet to be global and interoperable and ev everyone on the internet and in the world be able to access the global uh, internet and this and uh, internet fragmentation um, prevents that. So without further ado, I'm sorry I talked a lot. Um, we have Alisa, would, would you like to go ahead and start the conversation? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, hi, this is Alyssa Starzak. Um, as uh, Farzana mentioned, I am the, uh, the global head of public policy at Cloudflare. If you haven't heard of, of Cloudflare, uh, it is actually something very much in the internet infrastructure side of the world. So it's worth explaining a bit about what we do, and then uh, we can talk a little bit about what layered policy making might look like and why it matters. Uh, so Cloudflare uh, runs a big global network. Um, we use it to do a couple of different things. Uh, most specifically, uh, we actually, uh, the, what, what does a big global network mean? It means we have equipment in lots and lots of different countries uh, where we can cache content uh, to make uh, internet transmission more efficient, but also protect people against cyber attacks. So uh, what that does is it allows us to look for problems in traffic, um, cyber, cyber attacks, um, and it allows us to sort of handle them um, for uh, an entity online. Uh, so we're very much in the infrastructure space. Um, I think when we get into this layered idea of layered policy making, um, it's worth understanding a little bit about how we see the world and what it, it looks like from our perspective. Um, so one of the interesting things about Cloudflare service is that we actually um, offer some of them for free. Uh, so we have something like 20% of global websites that, um, that use our services to help protect themselves against DDoS attacks. Um, from a practical standpoint, that means we make a lot of the internet more efficient, which is terrific. Uh, but when you get into the questions of layered policy making, it gets a lot more, a lot more challenging. Um, so if you think about how the internet is set up, uh, at the very top layer, as, as, as was mentioned, um, is all the content. So all of the things that we all interact with online. Uh, so the, the, the websites that you interact with, the platforms that you interact with, those all sort of sit at the top. And often when people talk about the internet, they mean that piece of content. But they don't think about the other components that actually get that content to you. So think about the DNS system where people register domain names um, or uh, where they, so the registrars for those domain names or the registries for those, uh, for the, um, for the TLDs, the top level domains like .com and dot, dot, you know, the, or the country level ones. Um, there's a whole world of that. Uh, there's a whole world of entities that, that actually transmit that content, um, which Cloudflare is a part of. Um, and then there's the ISP side of the world as well. Um, so all of the different entities, the browsers that make it accessible in your, um, on your computer, all of those play a role in getting that content to you. And I think one of the challenges when we get into the layered policy making world, uh, we really start have to think about what effects regulatory structures have on how those pieces fit together and how they don't. So um, I want to give you a couple of examples of what that means in practice. Uh, so you know, one of the things about the internet that's so interesting is that when it was set up, it really wasn't contemplating the world that we live in today. It didn't have privacy built in. It didn't have security built in. Nothing was encrypted. Um, and so people took advantage of that to do lots of uh, often good things. They screen for security threats. They, um, they potentially use it for content purposes. But when you start building new structures on top of that, um, 
often those things either stop working or get more challenging. Uh, and so uh, to give you an example, um, people might block an IP address. Um, the challenge in that world of blocking an IP address, um, so again, in, in a country, um, is that if you block a Cloudflare IP address where we have millions of domains on us, you potentially block millions of domains. Um, and so now you've created a world where a, a huge amount of content's not available. Um, and we see similar things where people are trying to do something because they think it's going to be a way of addressing content uh, and an effective way of addressing content, but really what they're doing is potentially cutting off components of the internet. So really trying, when we get into that world of layered policy making, it's really thinking about the effects both locally um, and thinking about collateral consequences, but then also thinking about the broader global effects. So what happens when this is done in a different country um, with a different rule of law standard? What happens when, uh, when uh, it becomes the norm that that's an acceptable thing to do? Those are all sort of questions that I think we need to, to think about and answer. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alyssa. So, uh, Nobu, uh, I believe that Japan government is the one of the major advocates for a global interoperable internet. And uh, how do you think that this layered approach can be useful, or what are the challenges, or what are the questions? Ah, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nobu uh, Nishigata from the Japanese government. And first of all, welcome to Kyoto on behalf of the hosting ministry, our ministry. And thank you for coming for all. And I hope you have good weather, better weather tomorrow. After tomorrow, then you have some fun, some time to, to find more, not only the IGF things, but also about the, the depth of the culture in Kyoto. So then uh, about the question, uh, maybe maybe start, uh, starting off by the layer thing. I believe that the Japanese government is doing a pretty good job in uh, layer approach, particularly once it comes to the regulation. But uh, this is only layer one, two, three. This is our domain from our ministry voice. Then maybe after four, five, six, seven, then it's more people came in, uh, comes in, like just uh, she said. It's not only the, the telecom things, you know. So one, two, three, uh, particularly for the domestic things, and sometimes uh, the infrastructure connecting the us to with uh, abroad, like uh, for example, submarine cables or satellite frequency, etc. So then, like uh, we have very clear the structure in our like, uh, law is a telecom business law in Japan. And we, we are doing pretty good job, but uh, then for the issues in infrastructure, for example, like it's kind of away from this today's topic, but how we uh, secure the, the internet connection in the rural areas, even in Japan, or like uh, isolated island in the Japanese territory, like uh, that kind of things. So we can do that in a layer two or one type of uh, regulation or policy approach, we do that. But on the other hand, like once it comes to the content issue, like uh, maybe let me, you know, that since my assignment in the Japanese government uh, includes uh, some issue in the piracy or like a CSAM, like that, that's kind of content related issues. Then like, uh, of course we do the layer approach in one, two, three, but it doesn't solve the problem. We have to fight with that kind of the problem. I mean, CSAC is, I mean, CSAM is, it's more like a human right that we have to solve these things, fight together. Or like a piracy, it's, a, it's a only the, some, some people said it's only the economic harm, but it's, the, the harm is big. And you may see some Japanese, the, the publishers, industry, in the manga, like uh, you can see the exhibition, if you go there, they are waiting for you to show how they fight against the piracy bad guys. So, I mean, like uh, she just uh, provided the example of the, the shutting down the whole crowd fair. <laughs> we don't want to ex expect that to happen, <laughs> but still, you know, uh, we, we have to do something. I mean, uh, for example, maybe moving other direction, like, uh, of course, uh, I hope that uh, the, you found, already found that Japan is such a peaceful country in a society, <laughs> but still, we have bad crimes going around. And recently, like, uh, the, to some extent, the internet enabled these new type of crimes. I mean, not the whole internet, but for example, one example would be the telegram. 
it's a good tool and uh, in the end to end uh, encryption and that's a good one but uh, it's quite hard for law enforcement to chase them up so of course we are uh, i'm telling you that the japanese government is smart enough not we, we are not going to ban the telegram use in general in Japan, but on the other hand, we have to find some solution or maybe going around the technology just only for the law enf enforcement. But this is, uh, I would say, that the hardest part. You know, like uh, it's kind of arbitrary type of things, but also from the government perspective, we have some basic principle. The first comes rule of law, right? It's a fun the fundamental principle in democratic society. Of course, we respect the freedom, open the global internet, that, that these are the great values, I admit, and I respect too. But on the other hand, maybe uh, I'm telling you, you should be aware of that. The governments are not global as you guys in the internet. We have the boundaries. We do care about the boundaries, you know? So of course, like uh, the government, uh, you know, we are paid by the tax, so the, our prime I would say subject or customer, I mean, I shouldn't say you <laughs> is the customer, but they are the, the people within the border. Of course, we do diplomacy, we do some international affairs, but uh, the primary thing is within the border, that the government is. So then the, the other side, on the other hand, that, that the reason that we have some international organization like OECD, UNESCO, and IGF, and the UN, etc. So we, we have to know, we have to recognize some gaps between the internet and the government and the society and etc then like uh, just i had the opportunity to have some speech in the same place here then uh, last month it's the uh, 30th anniversary for the apnic it's asia pacific uh, network information center and it has it was just a 30 years anniversary so congratulations again for them then like i just talked about the, what was the 30 years ago so that 30 years ago, just I was an exchange student in the United States. I was alone, and then uh, having the host family, they are very kind, and then, and then having, they helped me, and then I go to the, the, the high school in the United States. And at that time, like, uh, of course, like, uh, we do some communication with my family in Japan, but at that time, believe me, it's just letters and phones, right? Like, no smartphone, <laughs> no Zoom, no internet, you know, no emails. So then compared to that, then, then like, oh, just the, the, the how beneficial the internet has been, then, then we couldn't think more about the, the recent development of technologies. But on the other hand, unfortunately, we, we see some new problems. Then, then I would say like uh, just very thinking for having me here, then, then like uh, today would be the first step to more like a get closer to have more dialogue between the internet and the government, even in Japan. No? So I would say Japan is internet environment is pretty good. Uh, it's free, but compared to other countries sometimes, but <laughs> still, it doesn't mean that, that we are satisfied as a government person. We are not satisfied at this uh, the situation right now. So, but still, I, as I said, that uh, the Japanese government is smart enough to respect the free internet, the global internet, but on the, on the other hand, we need your help to solve. And uh, this goes to the, of course, the, the other, other part of the world. So uh, I hope that, that today is gonna be the first step for the, the further dialogue, and thank you for having me again, thank you. Thank you, Nobu, uh, that's actually why we're here, uh, to have this kind of uh, conversation. And CSAM, for those who don't know, is child sex, uh, sexual abuse uh, imagery, material. And uh, we go to Jean. Jean, you have some slides. Uh, I'm. Yep. I'm gonna. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, next one. That was nothing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, when I was offered to to be in the panel, I started trying to go a little bit down the rabbit hole of the um, the concept of of fragmentation and how there's so many definitions about it. And I found out that there were a number of, of elements that seem to not be very much um, um, investigated, if you want, or considered. So the, the term 
bugs me a little bit because it does have some implications. So think about a vase, for instance. If you say that the vase is broken, it implies that at some point the vase was not broken. So if we are going to be talking about um, an internet in a fragmented internet, we need to make the assumption that it was not fragmented in the past. And I'm not quite sure that we do have evidence to be able to sustain both claims with, with perfect certainty. Um, of course, we do all have a bit of an intuitive feeling that these things are going into that direction. Um, I would be just a little bit cautious about which directions we think is really going. And so, for instance, when we think about fragmentation, I feel that most of the time I never hear anyone talking about the concept of time. So is that observed fragmentation happening in a short span of time? Is it something that maintains across time? Um, is it because it has been mandated by someone? Is it because there's a faulty hardware or a protocol that stopped working for, for, for whatever reason? Um, those things seem to not really much be on the, in the conversation uh, quite often. And next slide, please. And so the, um, the approach that I like to take is the one that you see there in, in the slide. So that, that, that's the layering that I like to, to follow, where you see on the top um, that there is a, a user, sorry, the user should be on top, but I didn't have space, um, interacting with an application through a um, user interface, basically. And then you would need to be able to typically um, um, generate some kind of identification, which leads you to some um, data manipulation, which is then transmitted. Um, you need to be able to identify the, the destination machine for that, and then you have some kind of physical channel to be able to do the, um, um, the transmission. Um, essentially, for, for, for the technical people, I would say that the, the, the UI is nothing more than uh, an analog digital and digital to analog converter. It basically passes the information and, and, and um, the will of the user uh, down the stack. Um, I do see the need, even though there's been a lot of conversation as to whether we need a layer approach or not, essentially because if we cannot pinpoint at which layer a certain problem is happening, it's going to be very, very difficult to try to figure out who do you need to talk to in order to try to solve it. And so I don't really mind if we use this kind of model or any other type of model, but there has to be a model for us to unite uh, across to be able to make sure that we know with which stakeholders do we need to, um, to engage. And most importantly, I would say that there's a little bit of confusion sometimes and overlap between different organizations. And it seems to me that we don't have a clear taxonomy of mandates so that we, again, know who do we have to talk to. Uh, never mind the fact that some of those organizations may not be the most accessible for, uh, for certain stakeholders. Um, um, next one, please. So when we also talk about um, interoperability, um, the, 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 three, the only three models that come to mind is this shared um, uh, situation where everyone is agreeing on how to communicate, let's say a protocol, or an ad hoc one where every single piece, uh, um, um, every device, every software requires to have ad hoc um, methodologies to be able to, to communicate with the rest of the systems, or a hybrid situation, which is pretty much what we have at, at the moment, kind of a combination of, of both of them. And so we are talking about interoperability, and sometimes I'm not 100% I'm not sure about in which direction do we want to go. Do we want to keep this hybrid model? Do we want to try to harmonize much more across systems? What do we want to do? Last one, please. Was that the last one? Oh, there was another one. It's fine. Um, I would also uh, um, submit that what I was mentioning about the, um, the different organizations and trying to establish a very clear taxonomy of mandates, I know that it can be looked as we are dispersing uh, the management of all of those layers. I somehow look at it from the perspective of the lack of concentration of one single organization where everything can be done is actually a virtue for uh, resilience. So if you think about an actor who may try to have some kind of nasty attitude, let's say, it would take them many more resources to be able to attend to all of these organizations and be able to participate in all of them so that they may be able to affect one of the layers, but possibly not the, not the rest. So if anything wrong happens, you could try to, to uh, rectify through, through the rest of the layers. Um, I think there's something to be said about resiliency based on, on fragmentation of organizations. Thank you. Thanks a lot, John. And uh, Konstantinos, start. 
Collins. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Konstantinos, or Connie, apparently, according to uh, the transcript. Um, and I think that one of the things that we um, heard, and it's sort of coming up, uh, across, is that the layer approach to um, internet fragmentation presents a lot of challenges, first of all, because currently the way, and especially the internet has evolved over the years, we are not really sure whether we can still use and talk about layers, right? Um, and, and that is because there are more actors that are engaging, um, and they're engaging across what used to be very discernible um, layers uh, in the beginning of the internet, uh, and also because more issues emerge that, of course, require state intervention and we see um, regulation. So um, I think that uh, starting with what Alisa was saying that, you know, and of course from Cloudflare's point of view, their main challenge is how the regulation that is currently happening um, within the internet ecosystem affects infrastructure, right? And the ability to provide those services, whether it is, uh, whether the, it is about security or whether it is about traffic efficiency or whether it is, um, uh, whether it allows users to be able and consume the internet in, in, in a more efficient way. Um, and then, of course, then you have the broader global effects, right? I mean, those unintended consequences can create some sort of global effects that then spill over, and we are talking about a complete breakdown and splinter of the internet. Um, Nob, on the other hand, coming from the government, I think that he raised the challenge that we keep hearing a lot of governments having. Um, we understand that there, is, there are some things that we should not be touching, and we do understand that those things are what make the internet what it is. But at the same time, we are facing everyday policy challenges as governments, and as part of our mandate, uh, and the fact that we have been elected to provide answers to those challenges, we don't know where to go. And I think the, well, Noble brought up encryption, which I think is perhaps the biggest challenge currently that policymakers are facing, especially in connection with CISAM. Um, I don't think that we need to debate at all that everyone in this room and in the world, hopefully, um, how they feel about CISAM, but at the same time, because it involves uh, the conversation, better yet, involves issues around encryption, it makes it very difficult. Because if you hear the engineers, they will tell you there is really, do not touch encryption. It is a very, very important protocol. It is very important for the security of the internet. It is very important for privacy. It is very important for the security of people. Uh, but at the same time, the fact that encryption exists and of, as a protocol is getting abused, is being abused by various actors in order to um, do criminal acts. Uh, so, and I really liked actually, uh, Nobu, your call effectively to this, essentially to this community saying, we need your help. How can you help us find a balance or provide at least um, a way forward in, in what seems right now to be an impossible debate? Um, and Jean, um, really, your opening really hit a really nice nerve with me when you said, I'm not sure there was ever a time that the internet was not fragmented, right? And we really do not know. Uh, and we really do not know because we only recently, if I can say that, in, in the, uh, we started thinking of fragmentation and fragmentation sort of came in front of us as an issue. But there might have been a time, even from the beginning of the internet, where fragmentation existed. And I think that depending on who you are and the, where they're coming from, they will tell you different things. Um, the, I, the other thing, if I understood correct, and please correct me uh, if I didn't, is that um, we need to be able, and there is a challenge uh, on that, on identifying which exact layer we're talking about, and we need to be able to do that, because unless we are able to identify that layer, we won't be able to know who to speak to, how to engage with that uh, organization or body, and what actual solutions uh, to give. Um, and of course, you went back to you know, the, the origins of the, the conception of the internet, which is decentralization and, and um, um, and the fact that decentralization hints, of course, to more resilience and um, 
why this is important uh, within the context of the internet. I think that the one thing that I can say is that fragmentation for the past couple of years at least has been the buzzword that everybody's using, uh, and rightly so in many, many uh, ways, simply because it is a problem that can create uh, serious challenges for the global open and interoperable internet. And especially in the past five years, the, we see governments stepping in to address some of those very hard challenges. Uh, and at the same time, they, in their effort to do so, there are unintended consequences that actually affect you know, the infrastructure of the internet and the way the, the internet exists and continues to evolve. And I will stop here. Thank you, Constantine. So we want to have a dialogue uh, if any, at any time you want to ask a question or comment or if you need any clarification of uh, what is this internet fragmentation and uh, why is it necessarily a bad it's not a positive thing. Oh, and I can see somebody at the mic. Great. Go ahead. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Barry Lieba. I want to come in on the internet being fragmented um, from the beginning. The internet, by its nature, is fragmented. It is a network of networks. Um, I have a, a home network that it does not have open access to the rest of the internet. It's a fragment. Uh, companies have their own fragments of the internet. There is, this is the way the in, internet was intended to work. So I like to think of what we're talking about as harmful fragmentation, which is fragmentation that damages the way the internet was intention, intended to work. And I think that's a better way to approach it. The question that I got up to, to ask was, I, I know what OSI stack layering is, you know, and all that kind of stuff. What I don't understand is what the purpose of this session is to talk about layered policy approach. And we're now halfway through the session, and we haven't talked about that part. So I'm, I'm looking to understand what kind of, what, what the layered policy bit means. Are you talking about applying policy to the OSI stack layer? Are you talking about setting up a layered approach to policy, or uh, please explain, and uh, let's have that conversation. Thanks. Thank you. So for me, uh, my impression is that um, I tried to explain this uh, in the beginning. For example, when uh, governments want to regulate, uh, not necessarily the internet, they can come up with a regulation that could affect the operation of, of the networks. And uh, this could be the for example, the IP addresses of uh, like uh, certain con uh, countries and and regions, and governments don't uh, necessarily want that. If they want an open global uh, internet, they don't want to prevent access of uh, countries to uh, to IP addresses. Uh, but the unintended consequences of that kind of policy, in this case, sanctions, is that it could prevent uh, network operators from having access to IP addresses. And IP addresses are not, which is at the infrastructure, as you know better than me, uh, at the infrastructure area, and they are needed and necessary for online presence. So it's not about accessing Zoom or accessing uh, uh, Facebook. It's about uh, accessing infrastructure that enables you to have an online uh, presence and have access to the global internet. Uh, so uh, I believe that the layered uh, approach could possibly help uh, at the moment, um, it could possibly help to tell the policymakers and civil society when they may, uh, make recommendations that, hey, when you are coming up with these content regulation, uh, uh, initiatives with these sanctions in, uh, initiatives, think about which uh, part of the internet you do not want to actually affect with your policy so that it does n it actually can be targeted and you can actually, actually achieve the, that regulatory purpose. I, I hope that was clear, but I invite any other... Uh, Yeah. Oh, if you want to go back to this one. 
Yeah. Can I, can I just add one, one thing? I actually want to make it a little bit more concrete. I think there are, there are two different sets of problems that are worth thinking about. One is when you have a general regulation that applies further down um, when people aren't thinking about it, right? So to give you an example, um, the EU has passed GDPR, um, lots of very important things for privacy. One of, the, one of the claims that has come out in GDPR is the idea of uh, data localization of IP addresses. Now, if you know how infrastructure works, that's nonsense. That doesn't work practically. But that doesn't mean that a policymaker hasn't thought about it because they don't think about how the internet works. So I think there's the general regulation applying um, and being conscious of that. And then I think there's also a secondary piece, which is thinking about infrastructure and actually what are you trying to regulate and how. Um, often what happens is that people go down to infrastructure first because you have, um, going back to I think Jean's point, um, the, often that is a place where you can get access to something you might not otherwise have access to because we do have a network of networks. And so practically what you find are that people will go to an area where they have access. Um, and so I think there are two components and I would sort of split them into two different ideas. Um, my name is Olaf Kolkman. Um, I'm sort of co-organizer of this session and I'm now at the mic in, uh, as an online moderator. So I'm forwarding a question. Uh, from Chukio uh, Kishara, who is asking, I feel that cyberbullying is a serious problem in Japan. Cyberbullying is one of the internet fragment, uh, fragmentation in terms of communication. What contribution do you think that can be made to address cyberbullying from a policymaking perspective? I think that's a very hard question to answer, but um, I'm, I'm going to add that a little bit. I'm going to add some color to that question and change it a little bit um, for the panel. If you think of cyberbullying and you think of that layer approach, how would you, on what layer would you put that, uh, that type of problem? And at which layer do you think you will not be able to solve this? Is that, I, I, is that a way you can work with that? Yeah, that's great. Uh, anybody from the panel? Uh, so I, I have uh, one example of um, not good uh, policy to in order to con uh, regulate content. So for example, IP blocking is not proportional, cannot be done uh, proportionately. And uh, we, if we block IP addresses, it's not j just like one website. We, can, we might actually block access to a whole set of uh, websites. And we have seen the chaos that happened in Europe when uh, they came up with a regulation that for like disinformation and IP uh, blocking of the, of the website, uh, of the websites uh, of uh, Russia was uh, mandated. And, and the network operators and ISPs had a lot of problem with um, uh, doing that in a proportional uh, way. Uh, so that's where uh, not to do it, or also DNS blocking, I believe. Um, and um, I, now the layered approach DNS is the is application, but still infrastructure and, uh, and necessary for online presence. But anybody from the panel would like to add? Uh, thank you for the raising of the issue of the cyberbullying. And, and, uh, it is uh, the big issue, but uh, in my observation, uh, it usually is, I mean, the, in the beginning, maybe it's a Japan's particular problem, but now I see similar issues outside Japan as well. So maybe we have to think about, it's kind of the beyond the, the scope of the today's narrow scope to the layer approach discussion, but however, we have to think that uh, like, uh, echo chamber or like a filter bubble type of the things that uh, you know the some side effects of using the SNS type of services so of course that like as, as I said that SNS also brought uh, a lot of benefit to the society on the other hand there is some side effect and then that this cyberbullying issue is more closer to the, I would say, freedom of speech, those kind of things in a high level of definition. So it's quite hard, but maybe, of course, Japan is working hard to, to, to do some legislation and then against the humiliation and over the internet, also like uh, the, some uh, legal systems about the, the, the limited liability for the internet service providers, those kind of things. So we are trying hard, but still, I admit that, that, that that's the issue. 
thank you. And we have a uh, Jean, do you want to go ahead? And then we have, will have Marco. I wanted to do uh, follow up on your question. Um, so when you were mentioning about maybe us talking about harmful, fra uh, harmful fragmentation, I think it's a good point that maybe we can also have a term for positive fra fragmentation. And so uh, the, the term splinternet has been uh, going around for some time, so it could be applied for the negative part, so the harmful one. And then I was just trying to figure out, but English is not my primary language, so I'm, I'm, I'm possibly not the, the best one to come up with something such as unified net, flow net, coherent net, cohesive net, seamless net, whatever, someone here can just raise your hand. It might be a good opportunity to actually to try to pinpoint a name for something that points out to a positive fragmentation that respects uh, the original intent of the internet. Thank you. I have a comment on that, but I'm not going to let uh, Marco wait. <laughs> Go ahead, Marco. Well, I'm always happy to wait, um, but yeah, I know you talk a lot. Um, it's Marco Hoogewoning, uh, Dutch government. Uh, let me, let me. I'm, I'm not going to say anything about fragmentation, and I'm also trying to refrain from saying whether we're taking the right approach or the wrong approach, but I can speak from experience as a policymaker. In 2015, one of our government think tanks introduced the notion of the public core, and with that, ever since, what we try to do is make a distinction on what happens when it comes to regulating the internet. We make the distinction of regulating of the internet and regulating on the internet. In my experience, so far, that is a helpful approach. We've also been advocating that to fellow governments, and I do think it helps the discussion forward, especially in international policy, where you can say, like, okay. And then I hear somebody say, like, okay, yeah, some layers do not have borders. That's correct. And that's sort of what that's sort of what we see as the public core, is that layers that are practically borderless and are really hard to regulate from a national perspective. There is, of course, the content discussion. And, and, and looking at sort of various remarks, and I think that's still where a lot of the challenge lies, is I heard somebody say, yeah, lawmakers don't understand the internet. And yeah, from, from where I stand, I think that's also partially a good thing. Not everybody is an internet engineer. And I used to be an engineer. I've stepped over to the dark side called government. And, you know, keep it simple. That's why we kind of try to keep it in that distinction of two layers. Because if you delve in too many layers, it gets complex. Another thing I'd like to remark on, and I, I think it was my Japanese colleague that, that sort of talked about accountability. Yes, the fact that we make the distinction doesn't mean that the public core and the people operating the public core should not be accountable. There are certain things happening on the internet where if you look at it from a neutral perspective, probably the only place to do something about it is that public core. And that's a really hard thing to do because that's the discussion we need to have internationally and that's usually the discussion we need to have in a multi-stakeholder forum to find solutions for that space. Some things are relatively easy, but you know where it is, it happens on top of the layer. The point I'm trying to get to, we can divide it up into multiple layers. My advice is don't do that, but also recognize that in the end, from a policy perspective, what we're looking at is public interest and that public sits on layer eight and layer nine. That public, inter that public interest doesn't differentiate between layer three, four, or five. We're trying to make the world a better place. And your challenge is find out which layer is the most appropriate to do the right thing to help us make the world a better place. But which public are we talking about? Whose public interest? Is it the national public interest? Are we talking about the global pu uh, public interest? Ooh, that's a difficult one. Of course, we start. Of course, we always start with the national interest in mind. But I do hope that our national interest is other people's national interest, and we can find consensus in the global space of what is the public interest. Absolutely, and how to rec reconcile that, uh, that is very important for the global interest. Uh, you have another. Please, go ahead. All my friends are here. Go ahead. Go ahead. We will fight to see who goes first. Uh, Colin Perkins, University of Glasgow. Um, 
I, I guess I want to follow up a little on the, the previous comment. Um, you know, it, it's clear that regulation that affects, um, that, that targets uh, and affects layers where it wasn't intended and is inappropriate causes problems. Um, the discussion has um, considered a whole range of different technologies. We've heard discussion of IP blocking, DNS blocking, and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, these obviously operate at different layers. They're operated by different people. Um, and understanding the differences requires pretty deep technical knowledge. Um, other ways of distinguishing those layers, distinguishing the, the technologies, and, and ways of phrasing those differences and describing those differences that are more accessible and don't need that deep technical knowledge to perhaps help reframe the debate a little uh, in, a, in a way which uh, might make it easier to uh, judge the applicability of regulation. Thank you. Um. Oh, do you, would you like? Uh, actually, Alison wants to uh, respond. To calling. I'm sorry, <laughs> bad one. You know, I, I, I think when we um, when we think about it, we actually try to think about what who it affects, and so we actually describe it as effects. I think the challenge is that it's when we actually have those conversations, we think there needs to be a translation, right? So somebody who isn't on the engineering side, being able to explain what the potential unintended consequences might be is really important. Um, and, I, and frankly, I think, um, we certainly think that industry, which has some of the technical knowledge, is, plays an important role. Um, I think sometimes, though, it can be really challenging to write things the right way. Um, recognizing that that's a, there's a gap between those two, um, because writing a regulation can be really hard, even when you're trying to get at something specific, even when you understand the unintended consequences, that doesn't mean there's necessarily a better way to write something. Okay, I, um, I'm thinking about the, the bullying thing, because I think it's a perfect example of where we need to look at this. Uh, Part of me says it's entirely a layer nine thing. You know, you, you crack down on bullies at the personal level. But the internet has changed the way that works. When, when I was growing up, if somebody bullied me, it was that person against me. And that person might get a few of his friends to join him in bullying me. And so now maybe it was five or six people against me. And the administrators at school could deal with that. Um, and now with the internet, you have hundreds of thousands of people bullying me over the internet, potentially. So that does change things, and we have to look at how that works. But at the same time, it's still a layer nine issue. It's um, do you stop the bully from accessing the internet at all? And, and I, I think it's a very difficult um, thing to, to think about. I think, so I, I like the idea of trying to think of that in layers. And I guess that's the comment I wanted to make. I don't have an answer to it. So. Um, I wanted to make a, um, a comment. I, I feel sometimes there's this kind of cognitive dissonance between the expectation when it comes to technology and the expectation we have in other industries. So. Unless there's an architect in this room, nobody really knows why this building is not collapsing on our heads. And we don't really care because that job is done and we just have put the trust into whoever is responsible for this to do the right thing. And so trying to explain certain technical things to the um, uh, general public, yes, for those who are curious, well, of course, you shouldn't be closing that door. It's just it's kind of assuming as well too much pressure for the final public to, to, to go up to that level of, of technical knowledge. Um, if I'm using a phone, uh, it shouldn't be my responsibility to know, you know the, um, the amount of ionizing radiation that I'm getting from the antenna. There's, there's mechanisms for that for me to not have to worry about it. Just as when I go to a restaurant, I'm not checking as to whether the, the water is drinkable or not. So to a certain degree, the people who are involved uh, in those industries are those that you would consider frontliners. And I would say that we need to make sure that the technologies who are being the frontliners for technology do have the tools for that. And often enough, I don't, I don't see that happening. Uh, thank you, John. I, ju I just wanted to add, uh, so, 
for the cyber uh, for the content regulation and conduct uh, regulation issue that should happen like uh, we have been advocating for that that that, that should not happen at infrastructure uh, layer and like the cloud services and CDNs and DNS resolvers and um, and uh, IP blocking so these uh, and by we, I mean the, uh, some of the, uh, some, like the technical interne inter internet community, um, because that cannot be done proportionally. But at, on social media uh, platforms, you might be able to um, uh, take cer certain action and for trust and digital trust and safety and kind of like come up with like takedown mechanisms and stuff like that. The problem with uh, doing that at the infrastructure uh, le uh, level is that you cannot, you might actually hamper somebody, some innocent person online presence by doing that. Uh, so um, I just wanted to add that and I, I see Andrew, right, Andrew? Yeah. Thank you. I'll take that as my cue to ask a question. Uh, Andrew Campling, I'm a uh, rudder consultancy and I'm also a trustee of the Internet Watch Foundation. Um, to, just to give a, a couple of, sort of reflections. Uh, I would respectfully say the industry has got a lousy reputation for, for giving reasons why something can't be done, starting with privacy. Um, so each time something comes up, there's a raft of excuses to say why not, and then when GDPR's enacted, it sort of seems to find a way of accommodating it. So I think you could replay what I've what we've sort of discussed to say, okay, the industry is expecting legislators to do things in a way which allows for the efficient running of the industry which I can see why the industry wants that, but most industries have to live with the regulations that are imposed on them. They don't get to dictate the terms that they're regulated. And I would respectfully say maybe with the maturity of the internet, we need to sort of face up the fact that you know, governments are accountable to their sort of voters, um, not to the technical companies. So for example, to say you can't do IP blocking because that will be, um, more difficult for CDNs would be one approach. The other approach would be to say, if the government's decided you do need to block X, it's up to the CDN to work around that and so they can still function. So I think you, you just, the, the industry's trying to have it to dictate the terms of how, um, of the environment it operates in um, and why should it be special compared to say car manufacturers? To Thank you, Andrew. Uh, we right have now. a last like 10 minutes, so uh, please be short in your remarks. Um, and yeah, go ahead, Rafik. Okay, uh, I will be quite short. Um, Rafik Damak. Um, so I want to ask a clarifying question to Nishigata san from MIC. So you said that uh, MIC or so much is not taking or uh, try to regulate a lot, but maybe I want to, if you can clarify more that how it's left more to the industry, the operator, telco, internet service provider, in different area like the anti-piracy anti -piracy regarding manga in particular or the CSM to do, to work on countermeasure and so on. So maybe it's, it's kind of a light approach, but it might also raise some, uh, it raise some question about accountability, and particularly it's not quite multi-stakeholder more, it's more the, the kind of the private sector taking the lead here. And at the end also kind of presented like how Japan is maybe leading and respecting the, the rights and so on, but what are the safeguards for the future? So I wanted more clarification, yeah, thanks. Let me let me quick answer you then. Then like I, we are not trying to do the introduce some regulation or legislation over the piracy or CSM directly. Uh, it's quite hard in the in the technical perspective in how you build up the law as a text like a code. We have like a you know it, it is not just so easy like just you know even that the, our prime minister he was here today but uh, just he say, if he says that that the, you know that the piracy is not good we have to keep manga industry then they do something guys right 
he may want to say that, but still in the technical ways in you know, how you construct a registration, then it, it doesn't work out that way. So we know that it's, it's more, you know, we have to check about many things in the democratic society, for example, rule of law and freedom of expression, et cetera, et cetera. So it is not easy. Then we are smart enough that to know that. So then, like we are asking that, uh, but somehow, I mean, the, you can do the piracy without the internet, but the scale is much, much smaller than, than what we see in the internet piracy thing. So then, that's the point that we need your help. Like we have, we want to do something just only against CSAM piracy, some bad guys. And of course, we want to foster and help them develop further in the, from the good side. And I would say more than 90, 90% in the internet community are good guys, right? Yes, so. exactly. And on that positive note, <laughs> note we, can go, <laughs> uh, we can go to the next comment. Sorry, we have five more minutes, and I promised I, we will be on time. Sure. Uh, no worries. My name is Azan Khan. I'm a member of the Internet Society Youth Standing Group. Uh, I wanted to talk quite a lot about my conceptions of um, internet fragmentation, but you can hear me speak hopefully tomorrow on the policy network session. Um, just a quick question that's directed towards, I guess, all of you. <clears throat> Ultimately, the battle for a global internet is a battle for global values, which we don't have. We keep talking about, you know, democratic societies and multi-stakeholderism, but not every single society is built like that. And one thing that I definitely note that everybody over here also knows but never dares to say is, well, the very same mechanisms that we use to control content and services and applications in one jurisdiction will be used in other jurisdictions as well. And that exactly is the problem that I feel needs to be discussed a little bit more, which is why we need to talk about, well, at what layer of the stack is this going to affect not only the jurisdiction where this may be legitimate, but other jurisdictions as well. Um, and we've seen, and I, I wanna end with, um, a link that was presented in last year's IGF, which is Protect the Stack, which talked about the role of infrastructure providers, and I, I can see you smiling over there, uh, because there have been instances where infrastructure has been deployed uh, or used as you know, a layer to censor content or take down content, and Cloudflare uh, has been on the other side of that. We have Kiwi Farms, we have Mastodon, and so on and so forth. So just wanted to know your thoughts on all of that and what we should do going forward in this multi-stakeholder setting. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So um, I want to use the last two minutes to think about where we are, uh, what sort of processes we want to use to discuss these solutions like layered approach and other solutions to uh, uh, prevent internet fragmentation. But Marco, very short. Very short, very final thought on both come from RFC 1925. Yes, it is always more complex than you think. Uh, but also watching this, uh, be careful not to add multiple layers of indirection. I, I hear a lot of people pointing to each other. So then to tackle you on that last question, I think dialogues like this help to prevent that. Final thoughts? Where can we go from here? How can we take this conversation and advance it forward? No, you don't have anyone. <laughs> you know, I, I actually think that last, that last set of questions and comments um, I think is right. I think that we need to figure out how to make the, this conversation feel accessible. Um, and also um, to understand that, um, yes, every, every nation wants to, um, to legislate within its borders, and sometimes when you start getting into the world of infrastructure, you are legislating far beyond your borders, and that is where some of the challenges come. And I think that's, that's I guess, what we were getting at at the layered, at the layered policy concept. It, if you are legislating to things that affect outside your borders, um, you should be thinking about that reality from a practical standpoint because that means other people should be can legislate outside yours, um, inside your borders as well, right? Um, that you that are not accountable to you in any sort of way. And I think that's where some of our challenges come. Um, I will say on the bigger question, we have lots of challenges online, um, and I guess this is a shout out on the, the optimism side. Like. That the best way to solve all of those is to think about how we work together, um, both uh, from government to government, government to industry, um, civil society. Um, we all of those have a, a role to play, and I, I think that's that's really where we want to sort of move forward. Yeah, just quickly to wrap up. Whoops. Um, as next steps, I would want to encourage that we start working on an outcomes-based taxonomy both for uh, human rights as well as uh, data management. That would be an interesting step to take. 
some final words, and then uh, I'm impressed by the Dutch Koi, that uh, the good for Dutch government, and uh, they have uh, the, such a staff like him, like uh, he knows both, the policy making plus the technology, and then, like uh, to me, just to be honest with you, like, uh, like I, I just talked about, about the telecom business in Japan, but it's originally aimed at phones. Then the internet came, then, then of course we tried to catch up, update our regulation, but the internet was much faster than our effort to do some regulation, legislation work. That's the truth, I would say. So then we had to catch up. Then, of course, we respect the freedom part of the internet. So then now it's time to that we have to catch up by other type, new type of a solution, that, which is going to be brought not only by the government, but also with the, your guys help us, and the, the technicians and the industry and the civil society and everybody. So Great. Thank you. Another positive note to end this session on. Thank you, everybody.